Welcome to Jesus and Me, your place to go for Sunday's message from Kingsville Community Church. On this Easter Sunday, Pastor Tom Harmon, lead pastor of KCC, takes us through the Resurrection Sunday. And now, here's Pastor Tom. I want to thank you. You're helping us to pioneer a new service here this morning, an 11 a.m. service. And we had a 9.15 uh, service this morning, and it was really, really well attended. And uh, this service is really, really well attended. And you know what? Jesus is going to grow his church because that's what Jesus does. That's what Jesus does. And so we thank you for that. We thank you, those of you who have uh, been watching on the uh, Internet today and streaming and uh, you are welcome in our church this morning as we are welcome in your living room or on your cell phone or your iPad or wherever you are. We're just glad that you have chosen to watch us this morning. And we just pray that you would receive just a special blessing today uh, through the words that are going to be said as we look at the Word of God. Today we're talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 28, it uh, Matthew talks about that first Resurrection Sunday, that first Easter, when the women were on their way to the tomb expecting to find Jesus' body. It says, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the tomb, and they came to anoint Jesus' body. But before they had gotten there, before they had gotten there, there was a, a, an event that happened in the dark of that first Easter morning, that an angel had come down and rolled away the stone, and Jesus had walked out of that tomb alive, risen from the dead. And so when they got to the garden tomb, the women were greeted by an angel that said to them, Fear not, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen. And that is the truth that we celebrate this morning and the event that we celebrate this morning. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But before I get into that, I want to tell you a little story, uh, something that happened to me last Sunday when I went home from church. I went home from church last Sunday, and there was a message on my phone, and the message was from my bank. And uh, how many like getting messages from their bank? No? Yeah. It's like getting a call from home from school, you know? It's the school again. Oh, no. Now what? And I got a message from my bank saying that I needed to give them a call, that it, it was quite urgent. And they, uh, so I called them, and they switched me over to their security department. They said, um, have you been uh, using your visa? There's some strange charges on your visa account. And uh, that's, the, uh, that's a call that nobody wants to have, right? And so we, we have a visa. We, I used to take it with me everywhere I went, except for a number of years ago, uh, you know, when, when we got into Financial Peace University. And David Ramsey, he says that, you know, there's this emotional connection and relationship people have with their visas. Well, I'll tell you, we have had this visa for longer than we've had our dog, Kirk, and uh, our boxer. And our boxer's getting to look a little gray around the edges. So we've had him for quite a long time. And I never take Kirk everywhere I go, but I used to take Visa. We were close. We were joined right here at the hip, and I would take him everywhere I went, and he was usually, you know, he was usually behaved unless I went into a Best Buy or a Home Depot. And then he'd jump out, he'd run all over the place, and uh, he had very bad behavior in those places. I'd get home, I'd get in trouble. And uh, so it was decided that Visa can't go out anymore. And so he just stays at home. He's got his place on the shelf. He just stays there. He doesn't go anywhere. He catches Netflix. He catches my wife's cell phone charges. And that's about it, except we use him for vacation. Now, now we don't take Kirk on vacation with us, but we take Visa because uh, he is part of the family and he is awfully convenient to have with you on a vacation. So he doesn't get out a whole lot, but apparently last week, Friday a week ago, he got out, and he had himself quite a time. And the lady on the phone said, do you use Uber? Now, I don't, do, do we have Uber in Kingsville? I don't think so. And I, so I looked up my visa bill, and sure enough, there were about nine charges 
on my visa bill all on the same day, Uber, 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 adding up to $497. And I thought, even if there was Uber in Kingsville, where would I go that would cost me $497? So I, I, I said, no. She said, are those charges, do you believe those charges to be fraudulent? I said, obviously you people do because you called me. <laughs> yes, of course they are because poor little Visa, he hasn't been off the shelf. He hasn't gone out anywhere. And she says, well, you know what? I'm, I'm sorry, sir, but we're going to have to cancel poor little Visa. And so I had to take a pair of scissors, and I mean, you know, he'd been around longer than the dog, but we cut him up. Because, you know, it wouldn't matter if it was 400 or $4. It wouldn't matter if it was $0.04. Cents. Because, you know, once that they've been compromised, once that they have been fraud or, or there's been deception used and deceptive charges against poor little Visa, he's done for because you can never trust him. And you know the next charge could be not four hundred, but four thousand dollars. And you'd always be wondering, is is this? Did I did I put that on there? Did somebody else put on there? So we had to get rid of poor little Visa. We had to cut him up. He's gone. You know, when we look at the story of the resurrection, there are a lot of people that don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus. There's a lot of alternative explanations for the story of the resurrection. One of the biggest, in fact, probably the biggest one today, is it's, it's taught by a, a, another religion, there's quite, a, quite a, a large religion, teaches that Jesus did not die on the cross, but someone else was made up to look like Jesus and, 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 and killed on the cross. And, and Jesus never died on the cross. They, they found some poor guy and they made him up to look like Jesus, just to fool, just to deceive everybody to think that it was Jesus. Now, now you, you know what? You can believe all kinds of things. And this this particular religion that teaches this believes in the virgin birth. They believe Jesus is coming again. They believe that Jesus is the Messiah. But this is what they believe about Jesus uh, and Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection. Jesus never rose from the dead because he never died. Because this great prophet of God, who is full of truth and encourages people to live by the truth, made the greatest deception in all of the world and tricked us all in believing that he rose from the dead by dressing somebody up to look like him and dying on the cross in his place. Well, that's one, that's one explanation that many, many people believe. The oldest one was perpetrated by the Roman soldiers and the Jewish elders and priests who when Jesus had risen from the dead and it, they reported it back and it's recorded in the New Testament to the leaders, they were uh, taken and they were paid and told to lie and say that his disciples had stolen him. Wow. And, and that still goes on today. And, and there's, another, there's another thought that, that Jesus was never really, here's another explanation, Jesus never really died on the cross, but he was only badly injured. And he passed out on the cross. And when he was put into the grave, he was revived. He, he, he managed to come to. And as badly injured as he was, he rolled away a 2,000-pound uh, stone, beat back the Roman guards, and got away. And then there's, there's those who believe, well, Jesus, it's a good story, but Jesus didn't really physically raise from the dead, but he spiritually rose from the dead, Right? That's out there too. And then another very popular one for people who don't believe in God or don't believe in miracles, they say it's a nice religious myth. It's a nice religious myth, nice religious story, but it's just a myth. It didn't really happen. It's just a story. It's not reasonable. And so we have all those things floating out there about the resurrection of Jesus. But you see, the resurrection is important and central to the Christian faith and to our salvation. It just can't be a story made up, a myth or a deception. Because if it is, then we have to throw it out. We have to cut it up. We have to throw it out. Because it's a deception. And that's exactly what Paul said that we would have to do. If the resurrection wasn't true. He said in 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 17, We apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless 
and you are still in your sins. In other words, that's his way of saying, it's a nice story, but just cut it out. It's not true, if it's not true. But then he says, it is true. There's a man, he's an author, he's a lawyer, he's a journalist, his name is Lee Strobel, and he was an avowed atheist, and he would get a big kick out of the fact that Resurrection, Easter Sunday is on April the 1st, on April Fool's Day. He'd get a big kick out of that. And because he believes that those people who believe in the resurrection, they're all misguided, they're all fools, they've been deceived. Until one day his wife came home claiming that she had become a Christian. At that point he went to war against the Bible to prove that the resurrection story was false. And this is his story. Atheist and legal editor of the Chicago Tribune, I would have smirked at the fact that Easter this year falls on April Fool's Day. Because back then, I thought that anyone would have to be a fool to think that Jesus literally rose from the dead. One day, my wife gave me the news that she'd become a Christian. And so I decided to take my journalism training and legal training and debunk the resurrection of Jesus. So I spent two years of my life analyzing the historical data. And what I found really shocked me. I recounted in my book, The Case for Miracles. First of all, I found that there's no dispute among scholars that Jesus was dead after being crucified. Uh, the famous atheist New Testament scholar, Gerd Ludeman, says it's historically indisputable that he was dead. The Journal of the American Medical Association says that based on the historical and medical evidence, that Jesus was clearly dead even before the wound to his side was inflicted. Second, we have early reports of the resurrection of Jesus, reports that come so quickly you can't just write them off as being a legend. In fact, we have one report of the resurrection, including named eyewitnesses, that has been dated back by scholars to within months of the death of Jesus. Friends, that is historical gold. Third, we have the empty tomb, and I found that even the opponents of Jesus implicitly conceded that the tomb of Jesus was empty. And then fourth, we have nine ancient sources inside and outside the New Testament confirming and corroborating the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the resurrected Jesus. Friends, that is an avalanche of historical data. And then we have seven ancient sources inside and mostly outside the New Testament that confirm that the disciples lived lives of deprivation and suffering as a result of their proclamation that Jesus had risen. Why were they willing to do that? Because they heard a rumor that he'd risen? No, because they were there. They touched him, they ate with him, they talked with him. They knew the truth. And knowing the truth, they were willing to proclaim it, even despite the suffering they endured. Friends, I spent two years investigating this evidence. And it came down to one day when I reviewed it all and I thought, you know what? Based on the historical data, my verdict is that Jesus not only claimed to be the Son of God, he backed up that claim by returning from the dead. And that's the moment that I decided to confess my sin, to turn from that, to receive this free gift of forgiveness and eternal life that Jesus purchased for me on the cross. And at that moment, I became a child of God. Some people have a rush of emotion at that moment. I didn't. You know what I had? I had the rush of reason. Because the resurrection of Jesus is not some April Fool's Day joke. It is a historical reality based not on mythology or make-believe or wishful thinking, but a solid foundation of historical truth. Amen. Amen. Historical evidence for the resurrection is important. Accepting the truth that Jesus' resurrection was not a fraud or not just a nice religious myth is an important first step to becoming a Christian. It's an important first step. But it's not the only thing. The, the historical evidence of the resurrection is important. But this morning I want to say that the resurrection is more than a historical truth to be believed, but it is a power that is to be experienced in our lives. Amen? 
Jesus not only wants you to believe that he literally physically rose from the dead, but Jesus wants you and I to experience his resurrection power flowing through our own life. The resurrection power of Jesus is not only to be believed, it is to be received and experienced on our li- in our life every day. And that's what Paul wanted. See, Paul didn't see the resurrection as just a, an event back there, but he rather saw it as something that was living and active in his life. And he, re- he said this, he wrote this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. He says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. I want an experience and an encounter with God that's more than just an encounter of truth. Although as important that is, I want it to go deeper, deeper than my head, into my heart, flow out of my life. I want to experience and know that power in me. And folks, that's my prayer for every one of us today that we would experience, we would know the resurrection power of Jesus in our own lives. You and I need to experience Jesus' resurrection power in our life. And it's important that we do because here's some things about the power of the resurrection. The power of the resurrection replaces religion with relationship. It replaces religion with relationship. You see, Jesus did not come to start a new religion. He didn't come saying, guys, I'm going to start Christianity. It's a cool word. I like it. And uh, thought we'd we'd have a couple of denominations and, and we'd do some cool stuff. He didn't do that. He didn't come for that reason at all. Not at all. He came to restore humanity's broken relationship with the Father. That's why he came. The resurrection power of Jesus Christ is the fuel and the reality behind your relationship with God. Without it, you couldn't have that relationship. If religion was good enough, you just have ritual. You just have stuff to do. You just have all kinds of of, of things and and, 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 uh, traditions and all of that, and that, that would be enough, but it's not enough. It's not enough because it doesn't bring us and connect us with God. God didn't want to give us a religion. He wanted to give us resurrection power in the reality of a relationship so that we would go out with his life and his fire and his power into our world. William Barclay writes this. He says, for the apostle Paul, the resurrection was not simply a past event in history, however amazing it was. It was not simply something which had happened to Jesus, however important it was for him. It was a dynamic power which operated in the life of the individual Christian. And folks, unless the resurrection and the truth of the resurrection moves from here into here and we experience his power flowing out of our lives, we will not realize the relationship that Jesus wants to have for us and live in the power that he has given to us. For Paul, even the experience of salvation was linked to the experience of of the resurrection of Christ. He said this in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. That means Jesus is your leader. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is my leader. And believe, where? In your head? Well, it starts in your head, but in your heart. That heart experience of his resurrection power. If you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the grave, from the dead, you will be saved. You see? It all begins, yes, here. Jesus rose from the dead, but it turns into a hard experience and transformation that he rose from the dead for me, and I have resurrection life living within me. An encounter with the truth of the risen Christ with our head is meant to lead us to encounter of his resurrection power that restores our relationship with God and gives us salvation. Now, maybe you don't believe in your head that Jesus rose from the dead, but you've been encouraged and challenged this morning. That's a good place to start. And what we need to do is to open your life to his power and ask God to just put it in my heart 
that you're there with me and you're alive and you want to live in me. Maybe this morning you've been a Christian and, and you believe in the resurrection, but you've never had that encounter with his power to change your life. So you need to really open up and say, Lord, I need you today. I need you to come into my life and forgive me and give me that resurrection power that will change me into the person you want me to be. It's resurrection power moves us from religion to a relationship. Experiencing Jesus' revelation power gives us victory over our sin. In fact, I'll say that you can't have victory over sin if you don't have the resurrection power living within you. Romans 6, 9 to 11. Because we know Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him, Paul says. For in light of the fact that he died, he died to sin once and for all. But in light of the fact that he lives, he lives to God. We serve a risen Savior, don't we? And he lives. But here's what that means. So you too, you Pastor Tom, and, and you and you and every one of you here, so you consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. I found a, a, an interesting testimony from a man named Richard. Richard was a doctor. He became a Christian late in his 20s. He went to church. It's good to go to church. That's a good thing. He, um, he read his Bible. He, he, he liked to do that. He asked for forgiveness all the time. And he tried his best to live a good life. That was Richard. And in his testimony, he said, but I struggled, terribly struggled with weaknesses and sin and failure in my life. I, was str I just could not get over this, this struggle. And what Richard struggled with specifically was a very wicked temper and explosive anger. And it was just, boom, it would just explode. And everyone around him would catch it. And he seemed to just have no, no control over this. And it was, just, it was hurting his marriage. It was hurting his wife. He loved his wife. She loved him, but it hurt so much when this temper would go off. It would hurt his kids when his temper would flare up. His temper would flare up at work, and it would hurt the people around him. It hurt his own relationship. And, and he would pray, you know, God, you know, take this away, take this away. And, and he resolved himself, like many Christians do, that, well, it's just God gives me forgiveness, and I just have to live, list, I just have to live with this thing. I just have to live with this anger. I have to live with this temper and everybody else. Because, and, and I hear this excuse around here. I've heard it in every church. And I've even used it a few times myself. I'm sorry to admit. But you know what? It's the way God made me. You ever hear that? Oh, yeah. It's the way God made me. And, and the, the, the close cousin to that is God hasn't taken it away from me yet. Is that one familiar? In other words, this outburst of temper and anger, it's all God's fault. See, and, and God's job in this whole life of mine is just to go, well, you know what, you're a jerk, I know, but you're forgiven. And that's how he lived. Until one day, when he was in a Bible study, they were reading through the scripture and something grabbed him. They were reading out of Timothy, and what grabbed him was this, that Jesus wanted to be manifest in his body, through his flesh. That, that Jesus wanted to be seen in the life that he lived. And I thought, huh, he thought to himself, Jesus isn't, surely isn't seen in my anger. He isn't seen when I lose my temper. And he began to read other verses. He began to get into the word and study the word. We're going to talk about character and changing our lives in the next number of weeks uh, in our connect groups and in our services after Easter. He thought, he began to get into the word. He began to realize God isn't looking to just forgive us and have us go and fall back in the same old thing, the same old thing. God wants us to have victory in our lives over sin. And he came to God and he realized the only way to get that is if the power of the resurrection was in his life. And so he asked God to fill him with his spirit. I need your spirit to fill me and to help me and to empower me to live and be the person you want to be. And as he worked with God and God worked with him and filled him with the spirit, 
He got victory over that anger and that temper. You see, the power of the resurrection says that your life is important. It says that what you do in your life is important. It says that your choices are important. It says that your relationship with those people that you love around you, that is so important that you need to live by the power of the resurrection. You need to be filled with his spirit so that you're alive to God and dead to sin. And that's how it happens. It happens no other way. You can't win the victory on your own strength, but an encounter with the power of the resurrection will bring you victory over your sins and your weaknesses. And what we need, maybe you're in that place where there's an area in your life you need to say, Lord, I need your spirit to fill me in this place because I don't have the victory over it and I'm not strong enough to do it. And you're not. That's a good confession because then it opens up for the Holy Spirit to fill you with his power. We need Jesus, and we need to experience the power of the resurrection, a religion over relationship, victory over sin, and then the power of the resurrection gives us a guarantee of eternal life. If the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit in you. See, there's no fear in death for a Christian. There's no fear in death. Because death is seen as just a door. It's just a stepping stone into what God really has for us. In fact, this life is a hiccup. You know, people say, well, we're, we're, we're uh, bodily beings having a spiritual experience. And we actually, got a, we actually got it backwards. You know that? We're spiritual beings having a physical experience. And it's all oh, so short. Because we were made for Eternity. Eternity. And through Jesus' resurrection power, we receive eternal life. And when we are absent from the body, when this old body falls off, then we go to be with the Lord. But Jesus promises that he is going to return, and he is going to give us the same type of resurrected body that he had. And that is our hope. And with that, we have great assurance. Oh, I'll tell you, without that assurance, there are so many people I've been with where they've lost loved ones, but that gives them assurance. Who are themselves looking at that very close day where they're going to be with the Lord, that gives them assurance. But people ask me all the time, where do you think my grandmother is? Where do you think my father is? Where do you think my mother is? Where do you think my brother is? And I'll tell you the greatest assurance that we can have is to know that they have eternal life. Because of Jesus' resurrection, they will be raised as well. Thank you, Lord. We have that great assurance. And then the resurrection power of Jesus is a promise of Jesus' abiding presence. Jesus' abiding presence. You know, when I, I, I love to visit my kids. I got uh, my, my daughter and her husband and my uh, son and his wife and their little, little child. We love visiting them. That's probably one of our favorite things is visiting them. But, you know, we're, so, we're, we're often glad to come home, too. <laughs> we really are. And I think they're, they're kind of happy to see us leave, too, you know? They, they like us to visit, but I think if I stayed a couple of days, they'd be like, oh, when is he going to leave? I mean, you know, I'm, maybe they're that, that way after a couple of hours. I, I, they're, they're, they're nice. But, um, <laughs> so they like us. They like it when they visit. And when they come to our house, we love it. Sometimes we wish they'd stay a little longer. But we certainly aren't pulling out the bed, you know. Here, come on, stay forever. No, no, go home. Go home now. <laughs> and, and that's because we don't have an abiding presence. But Jesus does. He never goes home when he's with you. Because he's always with you. And in fact, it was only because of the resurrection that Jesus could make this promise to his disciples and to you and me in Matthew 28. 28. Lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. It's only because of the resurrection he can say that to you and me, that we can have the abiding presence, a presence that is always there through the Holy Spirit, his resurrection power with us every day, everywhere, in every event, in every victory, in every disappointment, in every challenge, in every celebration, 
through every fight, every hurdle, every achievement of life. He abides. He is there. Romans chapter 8, another great verse of Scripture, 34, 38. Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life and is at the right hand of God is also interceding for us. And then it asks this rhetorical question. I love it. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Wow. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present or the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation is able to separate us from the love of Christ that is in, uh, that is in God through Christ Jesus our Lord. What does that give us today? Through whatever you're dealing with. You know, we, we, there's stuff in our lives we're just like God to come and pluck out. But instead, God says, you know what, I'm jumping in with you. I'm abiding with you. And what that brings in our lives is peace. Is peace. Without the resurrection of Jesus, we couldn't have any peace. But God's peace is with you. It's with you. Because Jesus is in the middle of whatever it is that you're in. He's there saying, I won't leave you. And I won't accept. I won't leave you. I won't leave you. It's important to believe in the resurrection with your head. Yes, it absolutely is. Lee Strobel is right. That was a great little it's important that it's an event that we believe and we know it happened just the way the Word of God says it happened. But we need to go farther than that. It's not good enough to be back there. It needs to be here. We need to experience Jesus' resurrection power in our own lives. We need to move from religion to relationship. We need to experience his resurrection power through salvation where we say, Jesus, you're going to be my leader now. And I open my life to you. I accept with my heart and believe in my heart and open my heart for your power and your presence to come in and forgive me and heal me and save me. Resurrection power. Maybe you need to do that this morning. It gives victory over sin where we can take an area in our life that we're defeated and say, Lord, I need this area to be filled with your spirit and your power to help me. Help me, Lord have victory in this area and you'll get victory there it gives us hope and assurance of salvation that we have eternal life that god is with us his abiding presence that gives us peace in no matter whatever situation that we face ourselves with let's stand this morning i'm going to ask our worship team if they come back and i'm going to ask uh, if our prayer team could come forward. It's so good to see you on Easter Sunday. And we're going to sing an old hymn. Ron and I were going over uh, the words of a song earlier this morning. I'd like to write a sonnet about your Easter bonnet. You'll be the (laughs) finest lady in the Easter parade. But you ladies don't wear bonnets anymore. Oh, we got a bonnet right there. She's a red hatter, too, so she's got her, uh, her little purple bonnet on today. Well, we could all sing about you, Rosemary. <laughs> you know, things change, don't they? Things change in our lives. We don't sing Easter bonnet songs anymore. Thank goodness. Even hymns that were great and wonderful 30 years ago are old hymns now. It's more than 30. Yes, I know. It's probably 100 years old. But you know who doesn't change? Jesus. His resurrection power is the same power that rose Jesus from the dead 
dwells in you today. And if you need prayer this morning, you come forward. We have some folks here that will pray with you as we sing as clo in closing. Thank you, Lord, that you do live. You live within our lives. You live within our heart. And, Lord, we pray that as we go, that, Lord, your resurrection power would flow through us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. If you'd like prayer, we're going to hang around up here a little bit. We'll pray with you. God bless. We hope you enjoyed this week's message. If you would like to know more about our church, visit kingsvillechurch.com. Thanks for tuning in, and don't forget to join us next week.